I am intentionally not thinking of any kind of countdown or milestone or, uh, you know, ways to, to, to see the time pass. I think, uh, that would be the wrong approach. You know, I, I think I have to, you know, handle this flight on a, uh, a day by day basis and, um, uh, you know, and, and just, just take it uh, very slow and methodical and not, not be, uh, looking for the end from the beginning. The second umbilical now separating from the tower, marking less than 15 seconds. The engines igniting. Ramping up. And liftoff. The year in space starts now. Kelly, Kornienko, and Padaka on their way towards the International Space Station. And there are the two one-year crew members, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko, saying hello to their crewmates and hello to their home for the next 12 months in space. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready. Hi, this is Scott Kelly aboard the International Space Station. I wanted to uh, do a little demonstration of these paddles, they're called hydrophobic paddles, and they, uh, they repel water, kind of like a raincoat, but, uh, but up here on the space station, they allow you to uh, play ping pong with a ball of water, and uh, it's pretty cool. questions over the last week, obviously in the wake of the loss of SpaceX 7. Uh, first one that's been on everyone's mind, how are the supply levels looking for uh, you guys on board the International Space Station? Well, they're, they're fine right now. Um, you know, of course, if we had any further uh, delays in our resupply, you know, particularly past, uh, you know, mid-September, October, then, you know, we'd have some issues. But, uh, you know, with our current uh, transportation plan with Progress and uh, HTV in August, you know, assuming those come on time, we should be in uh, great shape. And so is there anything special you or your crewmates are doing to conserve, you know, supplies on board, or is it just business as usual? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, it's not like we can throw anything away here very easily. So, um, you know, certainly when progress leaves uh you know the one that's currently here you you get rid of items and we we throw things away on spacex so um and H, htv and, and the other vehicles so you know when we if we don't use something or use something to its full ex, fullest extent it generally stays on board for a while and if you need to retrieve it you can um but you know i'm still consciously you know because of the last to uh, you know, vehicles that we we did, that didn't arrive. I'm still consciously thinking about um, 
you know, maybe using all the food we have uh, rather than scatter it throughout different places and trash on the space station if there's something we don't eat, just so it would prevent us from having to go and retrieve it later if we had to or maybe accidentally uh, disposing of something on a, on a vehicle. Uh, water, um, definitely thinking about that, you know, you can... You can throw away water if you throw away bags of uh, water or, or food that might have some water in it uh, or some like water samples versus uh, trying to reclaim the water. So that's something we're thinking about. And then some of the, uh, you know, our waste hygiene compartment consumables that are sometimes a limiting factor, we're trying to use those up as uh, much as possible. Okay, well, after the SpaceX event, you tweeted out, you know, just kind of reminding people spaceflight is hard, but tomorrow is always a new day. Do you care to elaborate on that a little bit more? You know, well, flying in space, uh, you know, building these uh, the space station, I think it's the hardest thing we've ever done. And it, uh, you know, continues to remind us of that. It's a very challenging environment. Uh, the vehicles operates, operate on their, you know, the extremes of their performance uh, capability. But, you know, when something like this happens, we just have to kind of, you know, lean forward, look ahead, keep, keep moving on. And uh, we need to, you know, learn from our mistakes. And I'm sure there's uh, things to be learned from, from this incident as there are in, in, in any, anything like this that happens. But, uh, you know, we, we have to keep our focus on, on what our goals are and, and keep pressing forward with you know, the, the resources we have, and that's what we're doing here on board the space station. I know the folks on the ground are doing the, doing the same thing as well. Okay, well, the next uh, cargo ship already about to head, head your way, the Progress 60 launching a little bit later tonight. What's the crew's, you know, level of anticipation to get this next cargo vehicle on orbit? Well, uh, you know, third time's a charm, I hope, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're, we're, hoping that that we get this one obviously you know like i said you know it's you know as as these next two if they get delayed or even move out beyond september october it it, it will cause uh, problems but you know we're we're as confident as we can be in in any rocket launch i mean there's always risks there's always chances of failure but you have to look at the positive and and we expect it's going to arrive on time but certainly we're we're always prepared for the worst in the wake of everything how's the workload for you guys up there still plenty of research to do i assume this is a big space station a lot of uh you know a lot of capability a lot of uh science racks and science modules and and science on board so you know unfortunately we did lose some stuff on uh, on spacex and i you know i really feel bad especially for the kids out there that may have had a, a science experiment on orbital and then one on spacex um you know nasa had some hardware on both those vehicles that they uh, you know rebuilt and tried to fly again so uh you know i understand how you know in those cases it can be somewhat disappointing but uh, you know there are lessons learned there about you know, keep keep moving forward and, uh, you know, doing the right thing and working towards uh, progress. But here, you know, there's a lot to do. We have a lot of uh, a lot of capability, a lot of science. I mean, more than I, just I can do, obviously, and, you know, with the help of my Russian colleagues. So we're looking forward to getting those uh, new guys up on board here pretty soon. Well, I mean, that was going to be my next question. Everything looks like it's still on track uh, for their launch later in July. You guys really excited to get back up to the full six-person crew? Yeah, um, excited, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, not just the extra company, although that's good, but, uh, you know, we need their help up here. I'm holding down the fort um, for now, but uh, it'd be great to have some extra hands. Also, you know, we like those guys, and we want to see them. And, uh, you know, two, two of those guys have never been to space before, and that's exciting when you see someone uh, in this incredible environment for the first time, so I'm looking forward to that sure you'll have some fun with the rookie space flyers um so shifting gears a little bit you're about a quarter of the way now into the one-year mission how you feeling you know is it any different from you would have been at a halfway point on a normal mission right now yeah so uh you know i remember the 100 day point um where i when i was here last time pretty well because that was about the same time my uh my sister-in-law gabby was was shot in uh in tucson and uh so uh, besides that, that that happening, I mean, even before that, you know, I had a certain level of 
I don't know if you call it fatigue, but just the feeling that I've been here a long time and and at a hundred at the hundred day point when you have a hundred and fifty nine day mission, you think about a I'm going to be coming home pretty soon. It's less than two months. Well, now since it's so far away, I'm, I don't actually feel the same way. I feel like I have a lot more um, a lot more energy, a lot more uh, you know ability to focus, attention to detail, a lot more enthusiasm about the uh, you know upcoming. 200 plus days so it was something i i thought about a lot and i wondered at the beginning uh, before i flew on this flight wondering if it was really like a uh, you know a last thirds kind of phenomena or was it more you know 100 days in space is kind of enough but i think it is i think it's when you're you know when you're two-thirds of the way into something is when you kind of start thinking about hey i'm coming home soon versus a uh, 100 days in um, you know, comparing this this experience to last time. All right. Well, one final question for you. Fourth of July, you know, coming up this weekend. Uh, how does it feel to represent, you know, NASA and the USA in space during the uh, upcoming Independence Day holiday? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's always uh, feels great and, uh, and a privilege to represent our country, uh, NASA. Um, you know, in my case, as a retired member of the uh, military, uh, but on holidays, you know, you even feel more special, um, and uh, it feels more of a privilege. You have a, more of a patriotic feeling, um, and I'd like to wish everyone, a, you know, happy Independence Day. It's a, you know, great holiday, great tradition, and uh, hopefully the timing will be right, and I'll be able to look down and see little specks of light over the United States on uh, the evening of the 4th of July. We'll have to see how the uh, orbital mechanics and such works out.
Station, this is Rob Navius in Mission Control Houston. How do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear, Rob. Great to see you, Scott. Uh, it's hard to believe, but your one-year mission is drawing to a close. Uh, it's certainly been an eventful year for you and Mikhail Kornienko. And in looking back, what would you consider to be the most important accomplishments of this year in space, and perhaps the high and low points for you personally? Well, you know, I there's still 10% of the uh, the time remaining, so I don't. Uh, I'm trying not to look at it like it's uh, it's over. So hopefully, uh, you know, things will go smoothly from here on out. We absolutely comp accomplished a uh, incredible amount of work, uh, both on the U.S. operational segment here and the and the Russian segment. They actually, the Russians actually have an EVA going on next week. So, uh, you know, we still have some very critical activities to do. But I think by and large, um, you know, our time here has demonstrated um, not only the capability for for us to stay in space for a long time and, and to do well, but also the capability of the ground teams uh, to support um, us and the systems that keep us alive and the, and the resupply and do this in a way that is, you know, forward thinking towards a potential flight to Mars. We've uh, collected a lot of data on our time here, and that data is going to be, you know, analyzed later and, uh, you know, research papers written. So, you know, I don't draw any specific conclusions or can draw any specific conclusions from from that. But I think, uh, you know, it's been a been a great success and a, a real privilege to be a part of it. Scott, you mentioned uh, the formulation of a future human mission to Mars. Uh, this one-year mission was all about gathering very important biomedical data in that regard. Do you consider yourself and Mikhail pathfinders of sorts? Sure. Um, I, I guess you could use that term, but I think we all are. You know, uh, you know, all the crew members over the last 15 years and, and even those that came before that, um, you know, flying in space is a uh, is a, a process. Uh, exploring space is a process that you take step by step. So, uh, you know, on one hand, you know, Misha and I might be at the uh, the front of that uh, right now because we've spent uh, you know a pretty significant amount of time up here. But that uh, in no way uh, takes away from anything that all the previous folks have done you know, towards that future goal of going to Mars. So I think, uh, you know, I think we all are, and as well as the folks on the ground that, that support us in such a great way to do these flights. You said pre-flight that your plan was not to count days or months on a calendar, engaging the passage of time, but to do your best to pace yourself in what amounted to a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, in retrospect, how well do you think you did in that regard, and what lesson uh, would that strategy yield for future long-duration space travelers? You know, I I think I did a pretty good job at it. Um, the, uh, there are, uh, there's certainly a lot left in my, my tank to, to uh, do some stuff if, uh, you know, I need to, to amp up the... Uh, the level of effort here in the next uh, month or so. Um, so I, I do think I, I kept the appropriate amount of reserve. I'm not climbing the walls to, uh, to get out of here, although I do really look forward to returning to Earth for, for many reasons. Um, so I think I've, I've done, a, done a pretty good job. Um, you know, the, the, the downside of that is now I have, uh, you know, a little over 30 days left and there's a lot of stuff I didn't do that uh, I feel like I have the capacity to do now, like personal things um, that I kind of set aside and consciously didn't do because I was managing my, my fatigue level. So um, the advice I would give to, to future folks is, uh, and future people is put a lot of thought into it because a year here is a really, really long time. Scott, your career has spanned missions to serve as the Hubble Space Telescope. You commanded the flight of Barbara Morgan, in which she fulfilled the legacy of the teacher in space program. 
and you've conducted groundbreaking work on the International Space Station. How would you sum up your contribution to human spaceflight and ultimately the legacy you will leave after you return to Earth? You know, I've been really fortunate, like you mentioned, to have a, uh, a, a spaceflight career um, that has had uh, some variety to it, um, like you mentioned. Um, and it's, you know, it's a privilege. And I think, you know, part of that is, is timing and, and, you know, luck, uh, certainly preparation and, uh, you know, commitment to what we're doing goes into that. But uh, it's, uh, it's been a real privilege. As far as my, you know, my legacy, I hope I've, uh, you know, added uh, to our space flight program. I know, you know, on the, the flights I've been involved in, they've all been very successful. So at least from a, you know, kind of a technical capability uh you know i've i think i've brought something to the to the table and i hope uh i hope i have too in other ways um you know like but like i said you know to reiterate it's just a you know it's just a privilege to be here looking ahead to landing uh, this will be your second return from the international space station in a soyuz spacecraft what are you looking forward to the most that was new to you five years ago during your first descent back to the planet Yeah, the Soyuz is a pretty exciting ride back to Earth, um, no question about it. And, uh, you know, people that have flown in it previously will try to prepare you for it, but uh, I think uh, nothing really can until you've actually, you know, been there yourself and experienced it. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely an eye-opener, and, and uh, you know, once you get past the, the initial... Uh, um, I don't know, shock of the drogue chute opening and all the pyrotechnics of various, uh, you know, firing for various reasons. Certainly the, you know, the coming through the atmosphere or into the atmosphere, the, the plasma that's, uh, you know, right, right next to your head versus feet in front of you in the space shuttle. It definitely gets your attention. It's so, you know, so much fun for me that I had said, uh, you know, after my last flight that if I, if I would have, you know, hated being in space for six months, I would have done it all o over again just for that last 20 minutes in the Soyuz. It's that, uh, it's that type of an experience. So hopefully, uh, you know, by me being able to anticipate what, uh, you know, what's coming, it'll be uh, even more enjoyable this time. Scott, the inevitable question when you touch down in Kazakhstan, uh what will be the first things you'll want to do, the first foods you'll want to eat, your thoughts as you emerge from a year aboard a confined environment? Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I don't, I, I, I look forward to like fresh food, like a salad, believe it or not, stuff like that. Um, but specific things, um, is not as important as like the experience. I, I actually uh, look forward to sitting at a table um, and just relaxing uh, and having a meal with friends and family um, when you don't have to worry about your spoon or your fork or your food floating away and uh, you know dealing with the overhead of that. So it's more the uh, that kind of experience that I'm looking through as far as you know food is concerned it's more of the uh you know more the experience and 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 what i've actually not had to be able to eat up here or could get on earth um the other things i'm looking forward to is uh you know seeing the sky from from below and uh you know air that is uh fresh and you know a breeze and a sun, the sun on my face um running water those kind of things people. And finally, Scott, uh, without a doubt, uh, this mission will take a prominent place in the history books when it's complete. Uh, from your perspective, what do you think will be the touchstone, the history-making moment, the legacy of this one-year mission? Uh, 
you know, it's hard for me to say right now because I think a lot of, uh, you know, what we're doing here is, uh, you know, because of the science. So um, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful, and I think a lot of other people are, is that we're going to we're gonna learn a lot of uh, information that will help us eventually, you know, continue our, our path towards Mars. You know, Misha and I are only, you know, one uh, one data point really, or two data points. And, you know, anyone who's a scientist is going to tell you, you know, you need a lot more, uh, a lot more and a lot more numbers, um, to draw specific conclusions. But I'm hoping what we find is our areas that we need to investigate further. And we could say that, you know, after so many months, we've seen this thing from a, you know, physiological or or psychological aspect, and we need to take a, a much closer look at this, uh, you know, before we we travel further beyond low Earth orbit for longer periods of time. Scott, I want to thank you for your time uh, today and joining us. Uh, I wish you all the best uh, to fly safe and have a soft landing, and we'll see you soon in Kazakhstan. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, my pleasure, Rob. Look forward to seeing you there. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Scott Kelly, welcome home. 159 days in space, quite an expedition. Uh, what were your thoughts as you undocked today and uh, so you backed away from the station that had been your home for almost six months? Well, you know, I kind of, I guess I reflected on 
how much work we did and how much we accomplished and thought that, uh, you know, it's such an amazing uh, research facility that we've built. And, uh, so so impressive that as, as human beings we were able to uh, accomplish something like that, building that and using it. And, uh, that's a place I'm going to miss. I certainly uh, look forward and looked forward to getting back to Earth, and you know, I have a lot more things I, I, I look forward to. But uh, I'll definitely miss the space station. Maybe I'll get to go back. To the the um, the impressions you had as you left the station, what was entry like? Your first impressions as they opened the hatch it looked like a scene out of the North Pole. Well, entry was, you know, I've heard so much about how the Soyuz entry is kind of, uh, you know, a little on the rough side. So it was um, sort of what I expected which is a series of explosions followed by a car crash. And uh, and then when the hatch opened, it's just quite refreshing to get that uh, cold air and, uh, you know, snow blown inside the capsule. It was uh, it was uh, definitely a uh, one, once-in-a-lifetime experience. You're fresh out of your mission here, but... In reflection, what do you consider to be the major accomplishment of your expedition? There was so much to choose from. You know, that's really hard to say because because we we did so much. You know, there were so many visiting vehicles. There was uh, you know a lot of maintenance done on certain systems of the space station that I was involved in. Certainly, a lot of science was done. Um, I think. It's really hard to say there's one major accomplishment. I think it's really the accomplishment of the whole team in putting such a complicated uh, plan together and, uh, and executing it. And uh, I guess that's what I'm most proud of. Scott, it goes without saying that the, uh, the wounding of your sister-in-law in January represented the test of a lifetime for you in orbit uh, and obviously for your brother. How difficult a period of time was that for you uh, as basically being in orbit, unable to lend uh, hands-on assistance to your brother at a time of crisis like that? Well, you know, it certainly was difficult. Now, you know, having said that, it was, you know, something that both Mark and I are, you know, kind of trained to deal with as military pilots, you know, just putting your, uh, you know, personal issues aside and focusing on what your job is, so... Although I would have preferred to be able to, you know, help him in person and, uh, you know, assist as, as best I could, I, uh, you know, recognized that my place was on the space station and, uh, you know, just focused on my work. And I called him and my kids as much as I could and other, you know, friends and family as much as I could to try to support them. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of support you can provide uh, in space other than, you know, just emotional on the, on the phone. But I tried to do that as best I could. The reports on her recovery are so encouraging. What are you looking forward to the most uh, when you get reunited with your brother? Um, no, just seeing him and talking to him and seeing how he's doing and, you know, talking in person versus uh, a uh, cell phone with or a satellite phone with very sporadic uh, coverage that you're always waiting for the, uh, the uh, you know, when the, the satellite pass is over. So that, that'll be nice. Scott, a final question. Your, your expedition was so much triumph, tinged with the tragedy. Uh, for you when, you, when you think you'll have time to reflect on it all, what do you think the highs and lows will be for you? Well, certainly the low is when uh, Gabby was shot along with all those, the other Tucson victims, without a doubt. I mean, when you hear... A, uh, you know, you get a phone call that the chief of the astronaut office wants to talk to you immediately. You know, you know it's not good news. And uh, and then to get news like that was just shocking and very uh, sad and tragic. Uh, the highs, uh, you know, it's like like how I answered the other question. It's really kind of hard to say uh, because we had you know a lot of different uh, variety of, of work with visiting vehicles and, and 
working on certain systems on the space station. You know, certainly ULF uh, five being there was, uh, you know, a lot of fun to have visitors. And uh, the HTV work we did was was uh, pretty complex with the robotics and getting it, uh, you know, first birthed and then you know partially unloaded and then moved and then moved back. Um, so I, I would say those those two things. Scott Kelly, Expedition 26 Commander, welcome back. Congratulations. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Subscribe now to go deeper into space.